Um, yeah, so I'm Salisha Chandra. As Lewis said, I'm the Vulture Conservation Manager for Africa at BirdLife International, which is essentially a global partnership of conservation organizations across uh, the world. So, you know, I think we have over 100 BirdLife partners and then we have the BirdLife International Secretariat itself, which has offices all across. And we essentially believe uh, very strongly that it's about working with local people, local communities, um, grassroots organizations and NGOs to, to affect uh, science informed conservation on the ground to have long term benefit. So that's kind of, you know, bird life stream it. And, you know, we're all about birds, hence bird life. But essentially, if you take care of birds, you're pretty much taking care of everything. So, yeah, that's a quick introduction. Thank you, Dr. Annelin. I'm Annelin Smith Robinson from BirdLife South Africa. We are the largest um, bird organization, uh, conservation organization in South Africa. And our mission is to conserve birds and their habitats. And that's to the benefit of both people and nature. So we have six conservation programs since 2020 at BirdLife South Africa focused on the conservation of threatened seabirds and land birds, as well as their important habitats. And our, and our main focus is to protect ecosystems and the ecosystem services contained therein. And we also provide policy and advocacy support, as well as science and innovation support nationally, as well as to the region. And we have a program specifically focused on providing support to bird life partners in Southern Africa. And our last program is about empowering people. And we've trained more than 200 community bird guides and more than 50 of those have a permanent career in bird conservation or AV tourism. Thank you, uh, Samson. Okay, uh, uh, my name is Samson Zaleka and at the moment I'm working at WNHS as a common officer. And um, uh, I studied environmental science and I'm a citizen environmentalist and uh, ontologist working uh, in different projects of um, bird conservation, uh, vultures and other species. Thank you, uh, Sion Hancho. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Sean. I work for the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation as the fauna manager. So um, I'm responsible for the bird projects that we run here. So the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation is an NGO. Uh, we've been established since 1984. Uh, we've had a lot of success with the recovery of some very threatened bird species. And um, yeah, uh, we'll, uh, our main goal is to save species from extinction. Uh, within Mauritius and the um, and also Rodrigues. Thank you very much for that. And to circle back to you, Salisha, uh, could you please tell us more about the endangered uh, vulture species that in Africa and the type of threats uh, they are facing right now? Yeah, absolutely. So, unfortunately, um, Vultures are possibly the highest declining species out there. Um, in the last 50 years, they've sort of, there's been a catastrophic decline. So we've seen anywhere from 70% to 90% declines in species. So in Africa, uh, you get 11 of what are called the old world vulture species. So it's a set of species um, and you get 11 of them found here. Of those 11, seven are either critically endangered or endangered. So, you know, you have the lappet face vulture, you have the white-headed vulture, you have all these different species of vultures and they're, they're seriously in, in huge decline. And what's causing those um, are varied threats and that's what makes it so difficult to address. They're diverse, they're cross-cutting. Um, they, they're, you know, they range from poisoning so which can be unintentional or intentional. Uh, unintentional meaning someone's trying to kill something else but then ends up killing a vulture. And that's primarily driven by human wildlife conflict. Um, and then there's intentional poisoning, which is, you know, vultures, they're sentinels in the sky, they're soaring. And so poachers started lacing carcasses because they wanted extra time to 
you know, rangers could then see where the carcasses were um, by seeing the vultures soaring and circling and then and diving down. So they started put, put, uh, lacing the carcasses. So that's intentionally, you know, to stop the sentinels in the sky giving out the signals. Um, and that is the main threat across Africa. It's um, it's possibly, you know, about 61% of the reasons why there's vulture mortality is by poisoning and largely it's unintentional poisoning. Um, then there's the leaf base use. So this is primarily, primarily in West Africa and some of Southern Africa, there's a belief that vulture parts can help cure diseases, can give you Vis, um, you know, visionary uh, visions of the future and help you predict whether you're going to win something or lose something, etc. So there's a lot of uses for that. So that's about 29% um, of the reasons why uh, why vultures are declining. And then the other 9% is what is I would say an emerging threat and probably happening more and more as energy infrastructure is being put up and that's collisions and electrocutions with electrical infrastructure. And that's contributing about 9% of the vulture mortality. The other 1% is you know, some other types of killing for direct persecution like bushmeat. Uh, some parts of Ghana and other, other places, they actually eat vulture meat. Um, and then overarching all of this, and we don't really know how much of a driver it is, is habitat, you know, loss of habitat degradation and and food. Uh, so, you know, not having trees to nest in, or, you know, Diblex, you'll know, like the, the cliffs in, let's say, Hell's Gate, right? You have a party in Hell's Gate called the Koroga Festival. What happens to the breeding of vultures there when, when you disturb that environment to that extent, or you have the energy farm there? So, all of these types of things um, are leading to their sad decline. Thank you. Thank you for that, Salisha. And Dr. Anilin, as the head of uh, Conservation Division, BirdLife South Africa, what are, what are some of the endangered bird species that you are working to, to save and ensure that their populations are, you know, thriving and, and surviving? Thanks, Diplex. It's always difficult to prioritize and we work on a, a number of different threatened species. So I'm just going to highlight uh, just a very few. Um, the first being our very embattled and endangered African penguin that's shown a very steep decline over the past year. So that's a coastal seabird species. And the main threat to this species is resource competition. So direct competition with fisheries in terms of food availability, so sardines and anchovy. Um, and we're working with stakeholders, including with government, to work on island closures, so closing of fishing and also noise pollution, specifically around our six um, largest breeding colonies of African penguin. Then just to add on to what Celicia said, so moving on to the land bird side, we also focus on vultures, because vultures are just so um, threatened uh, as a group of species. And we, I'd like to highlight just two aspects here. The first is quantifying the lead levels of vultures, um, also identifying the source of lead um, pollution, and then also seeing what is the actual impact of lead on um, our vulture species. So we've chosen white-backed and cape vultures to do that specific research. And then we're also implementing vulture safe zones. So that is working with landowners and asking them to agree to manage a large tract of land so it would be safe for vultures to roost, to scavenge or to breed. And we've su successfully implemented two vulture safe zones already in South Africa. Then maybe to highlight another species of which is unique to Africa, the secretary bird. Um, the secretary bird specifically, it's also one species in its genus. Um, and this bird has just declined over the last year. So in 2011, it was uplisted to vulnerable. Last year in 2020, unfortunately, we uplisted the bird to endangered. And this is due to habitat loss, but also collision with infrastructures such as power lines and fences. So um, our project is to track secretary birds to understand more about their um, movements, their specific habitat requirements, and again, to work with landowners to ensure that we manage the habitat correctly and that we mitigate the threats to the species. Thank you. Um, thank yeah, you. Carry on. 
Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Okay. Hanelin, for that. Um, Samson, we, we, Ethiopia is a key um, important burden by diversity, diversity area, and I'm sure there's a lot of work going on there in terms of bird conservation. What are some of the bird species uh, that are endangered and that you're working uh, hard to, to save from extinction? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll try to highlight some of uh, the birds that we're working with and uh, then um, I will go further in detail uh, for the critical ones. Uh, in recent years, we've been doing um, um, conservation uh, projects in uh, uh, white-winged flaftail, uh, ibis, liver lark, and uh, Egyptian vulture. Uh, if if I uh, try to highlight some of the current projects like Egyptian vulture project, uh, the Egyptian vulture is the only uh, long distance migrant uh, European uh, vulture species. Uh, it has got uh, um, a very uh, vast uh, uh, wintering site in Ethiopia and its uh, population is uh, declining in Europe for the last uh, 30 years and uh, uh, a lot has been done in Ethiopia to, to conserve the um, wintering and breeding site, uh, wintering site here. And um, the threats are mostly uh, poisoning, poaching, illegal trade, habitat, destruction and uh, collusion and electrocution with uh, energy infrastructure. And uh, the main one being in Ethiopia, electric uh, power grid lines, uh, we are trying uh, to insulate uh, those power lines along the uh, flyway uh, for the Egyptian vulture so that it will be more safer and uh, they can find their way back home without any any accident. Um, regarding the liver lark, uh, a lot have been doing a lot have been done in the last uh, uh, 10 years with our different um, partners, uh, local and international partners. Uh, as you know, uh, liver lark is one of the endemic species found in Ethiopia. It is a critically endangered species found in a very uh, restricted area mainly on the level plain. Uh, what used to be uh, among a very productive rangeland in Africa, actually. It is a grassland and ground nesting species that is threatened by habitat loss uh, due to agricultural expansion and overgrazing. Uh, the grassland that lives um, in is also threatened by acacia bush encroachment. And uh, the population estimate fell down around, um, was found around to be 279 singing male in 2007, and that has been reduced to 51 in 2003, 2013, sorry. So from 1994 to 2019, there is a 38.5 of the grassland loss to agriculture. So approximately 80% decline in population between 2007 and 2013 within, that is within 12 years. So, uh, Again, here, a lot has been done uh, through the years, like uh, uh, to conserve the grassland, uh, uh, to protect it from encroachment by uh, acacia, uh, uh, because the grassland is important for the, for the livelihood of the community, because uh, the, life, uh, the uh, community surrounding that living plain uh, uh, is based in you know their livelihood is based on their cattle. Their cattle uh, eat that those uh, on feed on those grasses. And recently, uh, the agriculture uh, agriculture booming agriculture and uh, land grab uh, com combined with uh, uh, drought uh, drought season has in intensified the problems on these bird species. So. Uh, what we uh, were trying was uh, one, uh, to develop and uh, promote community grassland reserve so that uh, those areas will not be grazed uh, for a certain period of time. And it will be available during the drought season by cutting those grasses to, to feed their cattle. In the meantime, uh, the bird can, the live and lark can, uh, can lay eggs and breed in those grasses and uh, protect itself from uh, also uh, some predators. So 
uh, in that, in doing so, uh, in collaboration with local stakeholders, um, um, a number of uh, achievements have been done uh, to prevent the extinction of this species. The Wildlife and Natural History Society, uh, that's the WNHS, Birdlife International, the Conservation Leadership Program, the Orima Forestry and Wildlife Enterprise, and other organizations such as uh, SOS, SOS Sahel has collaborated with local authorities and community leaders um, over the years. During this work, uh, work has been done uh, to raise awareness to the community and uh, government officials about the uniqueness of the bird and the importance of um, uh, of uh, conservation uh, and uh, support have been provided uh, to build the capacity of the nearby schools and the world as tourism office. Uh, furthermore, a few grass enclosures uh, that those that I say that community grassland reserve uh, or uh, as they call it, callos of around 300, 300 hectares of grassland have been set up uh, to help uh, provide live and lark uh, with suitable habitat and uh, to help uh, support 1,300 households by providing grass for their cattle. Uh, three community-based organizations uh, that the CBOs under the saving and credit cooperatives were set up uh, in the area to help the local news neighbors. Uh, so, yes. sorry, sorry to cut you short. Uh, thank okay. you for highlighting that. We'll come uh, and talk about the interventions and, and how impactful they have been in just a bit. Uh, let's bring okay. in Sion here uh, to highlight uh, what is happening in the island of Mauritius and what are some of the birds that you are working to conserve in, 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 in Mauritius. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, yes, so as you mentioned, we're a little bit different as we're a small island in the Indian Ocean. Uh, just off the coast of Madagascar, so we're quite far away from the continent. Uh, Mauritius was um, massively affected by colonization, previously uh, did not have humans in Mauritius. And since colonization, we've had uh, an amazing amount of habitat destruction and degradation to the point where at the moment in Mauritius, we have 2% of the forest that we originally had um, pre-colonization. So this massive habitat loss and habitat destruction led to the extinction of a number of bird species in Mauritius, most famously the, the dodo, of course. But um, we often overlook the other species that were lost. There was uh, many other species lost within Mauritius and the, um, the other mascarine islands surrounding Mauritius. And what we find ourselves with today is that we have a number of introduced competitor and predator species. We have a uh, witch thread and our species. So we work with the Mauritius kestrel, the pink pigeon, the echo parakeet, uh, the olive white eye, and the Mauritius bodhi. These have been some of our principal species working with. Um, the Mauritius kestrel, the pink pigeon, and the echo parakeet um, projects are, are well known because those species became very rare. Uh, the Mauritius kestrel population declined to four individuals. It was the rarest bird in the world at the time. The echo parakeet population fell below 20 individuals and the pink pigeon population also fell below 20 individuals. Uh, as I mentioned, our organization has been around for a long time. We've done a lot of work, um, very intensive work and um, we have restored those populations uh, um, we have been successful in downlisting uh, our species. But yeah, the, at the moment, uh, the issues we have is we have increasing habitat degradation because we have invasive plant species that are propagating uh, throughout the island. We have a limited amount of forest, uh, mostly confined within the mountain ranges and the national park in the southwest of the island. And so moving forward, uh, the threats that we need, are concerned about is uh, this increasing forest degradation, um, the impact of predators and competitors, maybe the introduction of new species um, that we're trying to stop, and, um, and then the effects of small populations. So as I mentioned, these species um, went through giant bottlenecks. So we need to manage these species in a way um, which will allow the population to recover um, taking into account inbreeding and other factors along those lines. Thank you so much for that, Sean. Um, uh, let's switch on gears now and discuss uh, and go 
uh, to, to specific birds. And um, I want to bring in Dr. Anelin here. I understand that uh, the white-winged flufftail is um, listed as critically endangered by the IUCN. Uh, could you please tell us why this bird is unique and what, what kind of threats uh, are facing it? Tiplex, uh, white-winged flufftail here is one of nine flufftail species. Um, it's an African group and they weigh about 30 grams, so like a small packet of chips that you have in your hand. Um, and what makes it so unique is, is that these birds are just so elusive. So every bird watcher out there would give anything to tick a white-winged flufftail on their list. But unfortunately, these birds are really specialized in their habitat requirements, and that's also why they are so elusive, so difficult to find. Um, and we know so very little about these birds that, to our knowledge, occur in Ethiopia and in South Africa, 4,000 kilometers apart. So they're thought to have a migratory connection, so to spend their um, summer in Ethiopia breeding in the highlands and then to migrate all the way to South Africa and then spend um, their winter basically in our summer in South Africa. Um, and the white winged flufftail, we started to work on this project as BirdLife South Africa um, about nine years ago. Um, and we followed on lots of work that's been done by the Middlepoint Wetland Trust. And we designed a research project um, to understand more about this bird, which would help us to actually implement conservation action because that limited knowledge was hampering um, our effective conservation actions. So we started with camera traps and acoustic devices in the wetlands, um, specifically here in South Africa. And we were rather taken by surprise when we found a breeding record, the first breeding record for the Southern Hemisphere in one of our main wetlands where the species occur. So now we know that we actually have breeding white-winged flufftails and we have more camera trap data to actually prove this. And we've also got the vocalization for the first time of white-winged flufftail. So this has allowed us to understand more about the habitat requirements of the species, to do niche modeling, so to see where we should be looking to find the species um, in South Africa and also across Africa. And while we're learning more about the species, we also have a direct conservation impact. Um, and this is directly through the International Single Species Action Plan for White-Winged Flufftail, linked to AWA, so the African Eurasian uh, Migratory Waterbird Agreement. And we implement the actions of the Species Action Plan, which is to protect the habitat of the species. So we have four ongoing aspects of that protection here in South Africa. Um, the first being um, specifically looking at a nature reserve at the main site, the breeding site for the white-winged flufftail, middle bent wetland, then expansion of protected environments, also looking at Ramsar site declarations. We've just recently declared um, one of the sites as a Ramsar site and we're working on a second site to do the same. And then community conservation projects. So we have a, a new, newly established conservation um, community project that will work with the community to re rehabilitate the habitat for this bird, create job opportunities and ecotourism opportunities as well. Then we also have a link with the work in Ethiopia through this AWA International Single Species Action Plan. And we're looking at formalizing a community project um, at the main site at Burger Wetland where the species occur in Ethiopia as well. Thank you, Dr. Annalyn. And I want to go to Samson uh, uh, before we, we, Samson, before we talk about the Libenlac, I will, I, I will want you to come in here and, uh, you know, um, uh, tell us uh, since, uh, they also occur in Ethiopia, the white-winged flufftail. Are the challenges or rather the threats that are facing these birds in South Africa only endemic to South Africa or uh, do they also occur in Ethiopia? Have you experienced that uh, according to your experience? Yes, actually, uh, we've been working uh, with, with one expert uh, that will be Dr. Brookside uh, on the Berga wetlands. Uh, on this project, uh, we have seen so many uh, problems occurring, and uh, we were we were engaged uh, with with local uh, stakeholders to rectify those problems. And among those problems, the breeding site uh, where the uh, white-tail flufftail exists is getting every year uh, getting minimized. Uh, this is because of the grass type is getting 
changed that was because of the erosion from the island and uh, around surrounding that mountainous area, those mountainous area, they started to, you know, uh, engage in agriculture and then the cash crop like eucalyptus, uh, planting eucalyptus trees that have created uh, erosion, the soil erosion into the wetland. And because of this, um, uh, the composition of the grass type is changed. And also there is also uh, a little bit of uh, uh, land ownership issues, uh, meaning a very vast area of uh, the wetland uh, is, uh, is dedicated for a research, um, cutted research. And surrounding that area also, there is a private ownership uh, of the land and the bird exists in these two different spots and uh, engaging those individuals and um, uh, the, the uh, research center to one action, bring them to one action consistently was a problem. Um, apart from that, uh, we are doing, um, uh, for the past three years, there was, there was a survey uh, for, for the um, white, white winged flaftel and uh, we know uh, it breeds there and um, is still uh, going, is still doing so for the last uh, three years. Thank you, Samson. And let's uh, take us through about uh, the Liban lag, which is also critically endangered, uh, with only 50 to 100 individuals uh, surviving today. Um, what are some of the biggest, biggest, uh, sorry, threats uh, leading to to the decline of the Liban lag? Uh, thank you very much again. Uh, you know, we are in a good spot to say uh, so many things about birds because uh, EWNHS is one of the oldest uh, um, non-state individual environmental or conservation NGO in Ethiopia, uh, you know, established in 1966 uh, with 32 environmentalists and um, it advocates for sustainable uh, natural resource conservation. So we have a lot of experience uh, in, in uh, with a bird, and uh, we we can say we are the salient bird authority in Ethiopia. Uh, saying that, uh, after that, uh, the Liban lark, uh, we've been working with uh, three or four different international partners uh, and uh, many local stakeholders also for the last more than ten years. And um, yeah, as I tried to put it earlier, uh, the the number is getting low every day. You know, it was, as I say, 279 in 2007. And it is a male skewed population. And that is also very dangerous for the existence of the species. And what is what makes it more difficult is the land is getting pressure from every corner. You know, uh, uh, you know, the climate change is not forgiving, like uh, we are having droughts uh, frequently, uh, agriculture uh, is intensified, and uh, uh, the bush encroachment when the grass, you know, when the grassland uh, uh, decreases productivity, the opportunistic, the acacia, uh, acacia and uh, drypanolobium will, will, you know, will encroach the grassland. And near that um, acacia, you will never find a very good grass where you know, the living life can, can thrive. And also it will be a very good spot for you know, um, other big birds uh, to, to perish and look for, for, uh, for the living life, which is also dangerous. So during this period, um, EWNHS uh, tried to do so many things um, by, first of all, by having as much as possible many um, surveys in the wet season, also in the dry season, and counting the numbers and uh, where exactly the, it exists. Sometimes, you know, there could be um, a habitat change or does the exact location of the bird where it exists might change. So for that, we are keeping track. And also we are trying to engage the um, uh, community-based organization, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, to support this activity. And 
over the years, around 1,000 hectares of the plain has been also cleared from encroaching acacia scrub to, to help provide more glass run for the livestock and uh, uh, the liver lark. However, uh, more recent years has, uh, has been the, the recurrent drought and the political instability we, which has put a, a lot of pressure on the land and uh, has resulted uh, you know a loss of a loss of uh, the enclosure of the the grass uh, the community grassland reserve or colors so this has led for the further decline in population and um, we still uh, are continuing to work with oromia um, uh, Forestry and Wildlife Enterprise, BirdLife International, and uh, SOS Sahel and Oromia Tourism Commission to have a very, uh, a very urgent intervention in the area uh, to further uh, save this species by, by doing all the efforts to protect the grassland uh, so that we can, we can um, support the livelihood of the community as well as uh, the existence of this unique and critically endangered bird. Thank you. Thank you, Samson. Um, the Mauritanian olive white eye, which is uh, endemic to Mauritius, Sion, is also on the brink of extinction. Um, could you highlight its uniqueness to, to that ecosystem and uh, some of the threats that are facing it? Yes, thank you. Uh, so for the Mauritius uh, olive white eye, it's our, it's the only species of bird which is endemic, which is still considered uh, critically endangered, as you say. Um, we have populations on the mainland. Uh, we've also uh, created a new um, subpopulation on a, a small islet just off the mainland. So the main threats, um, you know, is, is, as I mentioned earlier, it's this being habitat loss, habitat destruction. The populations on the mainland are fragment, uh, fragmented. Uh, they're obviously restricted to the areas of suitable forest. And then on top of that, you have the introduction of these um, invasive species, um, exotic uh, competitors and predator species. So unfortunately, we have uh, mongoose, uh, rats, cats that have all been introduced to Mauritius, which weren't here previously. So um, we found out through research that for the olive white eye, uh, rat predation, uh, specifically on breeding attempts, so rats taking eggs and uh, potentially taking chicks, is, um, is stopping the population from remaining viable over time. So we've seen declines. Um, fortunately, the work we've done so far has um, stabilized the population. As I said, we've created this um, additional population, which is on an offshore islet, which is um, free of these species. Um, but looking to the future, we need to address these problems on the mainland and, and create more subpopulations and, and increase the population. So uh, the Mauritius of the white tide is a small passerine. Uh, it weighs only eight grams. Um, it's very territorial. Uh, they, they tend to stay in pairs and, um, and defend their territories. Um, they are restricted at the moment to actually to areas of um, good native habitat, but also to some extent they have adapted to um, exotic species which produce a lot of flowering, um, which is beneficial to them. So for us, um, we, we are developing systems for, for controlling um, specifically rat populations over large scales. Um, because we believe this is the key to, um, to safeguarding them in the future and providing uh, safe areas for them to breed. Uh, intensive monitoring is the other approach we take. We, um, we, we try and monitor populations as closely as we can so that we can learn as much about the species as possible and find the best approach to, um, as I say, safeguarding the species in the long term. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sion. Um, as we move on to part four of this uh, discussion, I would like to bring in Salisha here uh, to highlight. Uh, kindly, Salisha, could you highlight some of the interventions that uh, uh, BirdLife Africa is putting, you know, in, uh, you know, in partnership with all the other uh, partners across Africa in important bird and biodiversity areas? 
uh, to, to help save uh, the vultures and uh, ensure that their populations are, 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 are key and that, that they're surviving and that um, they thrive. Yeah, thanks, Diblix. Um, so the bird life sort of vulture conservation strategy hangs on four pillars, I would say. So one is kind of understanding what's happening so that you can then develop a solution or try things to address that issue. Um, then there's uh, bringing awareness and education to the issue and, and making people understand why are vultures important, why their decline is, you know, that they are declining. I think people sometimes go to the parks and they'll see, especially here in Kenya, they'll see lots of white-backed vultures. So they don't even think, you know, a lot of people are like, Salisha, you work in vulture conservation. Do we really need to conserve vultures? Like why? Why? Because maybe they see them too much or why? Because why are they important kind of thing? So there's that awareness and education component also with poisoning and things like that. And then there's, um, sort of direct action on the ground. You know, Annaline talked about vulture safe zones and creating these safe spaces and, and you know, protecting habitat. Um, so things like that. And then finally, there's also policy and legislation. So these are enabling things, right? Like you can do lots of actions on the ground, but sometimes if you don't have control over like what pesticides are being used and how they're distributed, then those efforts may not be as fruitful if you don't have the policies and legislation to support it. Or if vultures are not recognized as, um, you know, endangered species and are not protected by the local wildlife laws or the light laws are not enforced, um, you know, you could you could talk to someone about a belief based use and say, you know, we're trying to change behavior, but then you don't have the law on your side. So from bird life's perspective, we kind of look at all of those four and and help along and support our partners across the region um, and the various sub regions to essentially deliver conservation action across those things. So I don't know if you want me to give some examples. Um, Diplex? Sure, sure. Go ahead, please. Yeah. So I think, you know, I'll go back to the threats. So I, in terms of understanding uh, the, the drivers and things like that, there was a lot of work done in 2016. So I won't, you know, rehash that because we have talked about this. But essentially, we understood, you know, the various threats. And so based on that, uh, let's say in East Africa, we realized that unintentional poisoning was the biggest uh, problem. Um, with human wildlife conflict, especially in Kenya, Tanzania. And so here, there have been a lot of efforts to combat that poisoning from a policy perspective, but also by putting in mechanisms on the ground, um, which include rapid response. So being able to, so we know that a poisoning has happened, but like, how can we limit the mortality or the deaths of vultures and other wildlife for that matter from that poisoning event? because it's not just a vulture that dies, it's also jackals and hyenas and, and you know all sorts of other wildlife, whoever feeds on a carcass. So being able to respond and reduce that. The other side of that is also reduce the poisoning in the first place, yeah? So helping communities uh, in these areas understand why poisoning is so detrimental both to their health, the environment, and to all these species. So there's a lot of community engagement that happens. This we see replicated in different places. So that's, you know, kind of trying to combat poisoning. Um, and vulture safe zones, as Hanaline said, also play a part in that because you basically have these landowners or communities that essentially say, hey, you know, we agree that vultures are important. We're going to do, we're going to create a safe space for them, which will involve not using, hopefully, lead ammunition. Um, apologies for that. Uh, lead ammunition and, you know, in, if it's a hunting concession or not using pesticides. So that safe zones and, you know, bird life uh, through its partnership has created about half a million hectares of vulture safe zones in Southern Africa. Um, and so that's, you know, that'll be key to protecting the species. Then the other thing is addressing belief-based use. And, you know, you've talked to Dr. Joseph about that happening in Nigeria, and it's about promoting alternatives. It's a whole long chain of, uh, you know, behavior change on that aspect, and that's probably going to take a while. 
and there's also the law side of it. And so enhancing capacity and capability of people to even recognize what's a vulture part, uh, you know, and, and that the vulture, this is an endangered species, you know, like a pangolin scale, like this is really not great if this is being traded, um, you know, because sometimes it may just pass through and people don't realize it's endangered. So that kind of level of capacity building and engagement. Um, and yeah, and, I, you know, as I said, policy and legislation, I think, you know, Samson's talked about what's happening in Ethiopia. Uh, with regards to addressing the collisions and infrastructure, the same thing happens in vulture safe zones. You know, there's bird safe energy. Similar in Morocco, uh, they've done a sensitivity analysis to address that, but they've also created an amazing aviary and had a reintroduction of griffin vultures there into the wild after like 40 years they've been seen breeding. So these are the, some of the things that, you know, our partners are doing across the board. Um, and we're really, uh, for us, I, I know you didn't ask this question, but I'm going to say, <laughs> I'm going to put a little thing. For us, what's really important right now, because of the scale of the issue that we're facing um, and how widespread it is, that we basically need to do more and we need to do it more urgently, right? So we all these things that we're trialing and have tried out, they need to spread across the sub-regions um, more effectively. Talking, talking of doing more and doing more urgently, Salisha, um, and I'm glad you also mentioned about Dr. Onoja, who I just had a conversation with uh, in that podcast that we did, and he mentioned creating alternative livelihoods for the local communities. How does that look like going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a really interesting idea. It's something that we're also considering in Tanzania, because Part, part of the reason sort of in East Africa or even with the traditional healers is that, um, you know, this is their livelihood, right? So you can't really uh, blame anyone, you know, that much. When someone comes into your house and steals everything you have, you're going to retaliate. Some people retaliate by killing or, you know, but in that, in that way. Um, and so having the space where, okay, you understand why it's an issue, but then you also are providing solutions. We can't just go in there as conservationists and say, ah, uh -uh, you can't do this without providing an option and an alternative or coming up with that. And that always has to be, you know, in the bird life sort of motto with, together with the community. It's not something that we're gonna come in and say, this is what you should do. We're trying to come up with these solutions together. And so alternative livelihoods is, is something that is important. Um, we also don't want to change too much of you know, the, the culture of where we are at. So you can't ask a pastoralist to give up you know, being a pastoralist, especially when it's such a, it is actually a very compatible land use with wildlife conservation as a whole. So it's, it's you know, with traditional healers, it could be really interesting to promote the plant-based alternatives. So you're coming with a solution and, and together with them and identifying what are the possibilities. But as I said, that's, that involves behavior change and that will take a long time. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, sorry, uh, go ahead. No, no, just finish, finish. <laughs> no, I'm just going to say in Tanzania, uh, the, they've had a little bit of success with what's called a community revolving fund linked to conservation outcomes. And so we're thinking about how do we use that in the vulture, uh, vulture conservation space, because they did this with an ecosystem restoration project um, in Lake Natron, and they, they did it around planting trees and, and mangroves essentially uh, in that area. So we're trying to figure out how, do we, how, do, how could we do that alternative livelihoods with a community revolving fund that then sustains itself, right? Because you don't want to go in and uh, give someone a bunch of bee boxes and then you go away and you train them and then there's nothing sustaining that, you know, which is something you see a lot of with alternative livelihoods. You go in and you, you provide a solution, but then you kind of leave it and there's nothing, you know, to sustain it. And that's really, really key when it comes to that. Yeah, and then I think another key the thing uh, in providing these solutions is to tailor make these solutions to, uh, you know, um, go in sync with their traditional values and traditional customs, because most of these protected areas or rather important bird and biodiversity um, areas are, are, are near, you know, local community areas, right? 
I mean, absolutely. Especially when you're talking about our continent here, right? As, as I think it's the same in Southern South America as well. It's, it's that indigenous knowledge. It's that traditional ways of being. Um, you know, we talked, uh, Sean talked about what happened in Mauritius what colonization right so we have the same issues in, in in the continent that have created the separation uh and you know being bringing more people into conservation and bringing people who have lived with these wildlife uh and and respect it because a lot of people have you know they have values with vultures across whether it's Burkina Faso or, or a pastoralist they actually really value vultures um and so bringing that back is so important Thank you. Thank you, Salisha, for that. I would like to bring in um, Dr. Hanelin here. And what are some of the interventions that you've been able to put in, in South Africa, really? And how impactful have they been so far? Thanks, Deblik. So just to add on, uh, I realized I've actually um, I've gone into some of the interventions when um, speaking about the threat. So just to highlight again for this critically endangered bird about 250 of them estimated left in the wild. The, the main threat to the species, as Samson also explained in Ethiopia, is habitat degradation and loss. And that's similar in South Africa. And, and that's why we put such a big emphasis on protecting habitat for the species. And um, as I explained, we have those four main interventions in terms of habitat protection. So nature reserves, protected areas, protected environments, Ramsar declarations, as well as focusing on community conservation projects. But then beyond that, as we've learned more about the species habitat requirements when a process of using the species as a flagship for wetland conservation. So this is where we want to bring the species back into an ecosystem approach. And uh, we're talking about a, a small little elusive bird, um, which for people out there is just a little bird species and or what is it actually worth in the ecosystem. So we're using this flagship to write management guidelines for high altitude wetland protection in South Africa. And we have large buy-in for those already from government as well as from private landowners. Um, so apart from the protected area status, we're also working with these private landowners and um, that is how we are um, protecting the species. Then unfortunately, one more threat um, that's worth mentioning is specifically mining applications, so coal and diamond mining um, within our high altitude wetland areas in South Africa. And this is a direct threat to the species. So we are actively opposing where we can in terms of our advocacy approach, but we're also working proactively where we can specifically um, with the different government apartments to try to exclude those properties um, from mining. And then lastly, I'd um, like to also mention raising awareness. So we've taken the species, we've made it the bird of the year a few years ago. We've established a festival that's called the Flufftail Festival for specifically for water bird, wetland and water conservation. So again, using it as a flagship species. And we've been educating um, more than a thousand children every year, specifically around this um, awareness uh, for water and wetland conservation using the white wing Flufftail. Um, and I'd like to say that many more people know about white wing fluff in South Africa um, compared to a few years ago. And how, how has that been impactful uh, uh, to, to raise more awareness, especially to the young people who, who are not uh, curious enough about, you know, bad conservation? They're just, we, we, we only hear about rhinos, lions, and and um, and uh, elephants, but white winged fluff tail, especially to the young people, how impactful is that? And how, how crucial is including young people in this conversation? It's absolutely critical. It's, it's critical to, to raise that awareness for small small species and and ecosystems, understanding yeah, that ecosystems isn't only about lions and rhinos and, and the big, big species that we like to highlight, but, but everything is part and parcel of it. And for Flufftail specifically, we, we live in a water scarce country. So we've put a lot of emphasis on um, protecting our wetlands and the importance of wetlands, so the role of wetlands in, in providing clean water to communities um, and using that to raise awareness for the bird um, and for its habitat. 
Thank you, thank you, Annelene. Um, Sion, uh, how 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 have the interventions been on in in Mauritius, and how impactful have they been so far? Yeah, thank you, Dibek. So, as I mentioned earlier, we had three species in particular that went to particularly low numbers: um, the Echoparity, parakeet, the Mauritius kestrel, and the pink pigeon. And essentially, what we did, um, we did intensive um, monitoring and management of those species, very hands-on approach. So um, for the um, excuse me, for the for all of those species, we needed to learn about them by following them in the field and um, finding as many nesting attempts, watching behaviors, learning about the ecology, what they're feeding on. And with that information, then we could identify the threats, the key threats that were stopping the populations from either from growing or were causing decline. And then we could address those threats. So, um, and then due to how um, small these populations were, we had to take fairly radical measures to, to, to conserve them. So that means we were collecting eggs and chicks from the wild, bringing them into captivity, hand rearing them. Uh, creating captive populations to facilitate releases into safe areas or into areas within their former range and then supporting them once we release them. So um, we provide food for the species where it's applicable, um, which also facilitates our monitoring and our management of the species. And um, we also do predator control where necessary. We need to address the threat of some of the species, um, which will predate the birds once they're released. And then we have intensive monitoring um, moving through these projects and continuous so that we can track whether the populations are stable in a state of decline or whether we've making progress. Um, so we've been very successful, as I mentioned previously. The echo parakeet is over 800 individuals today and is considered uh, vulnerable, or uh, previously considered critically endangered. The Mauritius kestrel is considered uh, endangered. It has a population of over 350. And the pink pigeon population has a population of over 500 today and some, uh, around nine subpopulations within Mauritius. So we've been very successful. Um, we've learned a lot over time, what is works, what doesn't work. Um, sometimes at the very early stage, the hands-on approach, very intensive is necessary. But what we try and do is as the population recovers and the numbers increase, we try and take a step back and minimize the management because what we want to achieve is we want to reach a place where um, the population is essentially as much as possible a natural viable population that needs very little intervention because we're realistic in the sense that we know that we won't always be able to uh, put the same amount of uh, resource into each species uh, and that's not something that we would want to do either it's not sustainable so our goal is to restore species um, give them a helping hand when they need it and when, get, when they get to a point where they are um, starting to increase in numbers and um, we have uh, an increase in range and potentially multiple subpopulations, then we can start thinking about moving back our management. How we decide to, to, um, to manage the birds and how we adapt is through research. So through the data that we collect, we, um, we decide is this action that we're taking beneficial? Is it necessary? Does it need to continue? And um, what? And we also look to collaborators and to to other projects for advice in terms of what works, what doesn't work, what potentially is the next step for us. And we're always trying new approaches uh, for the olive white eye at the moment. Uh, as I mentioned, we're trying to control rats over large areas. We're using um, self-resetting um, instant kill traps. Um, placed um, in a grid formation and creating mainland islands. So um, similar approaches used to other countries, very used widely within New Zealand, where we try and replicate the effect of an island uh, on the mainland. So um, we try and isolate a, an area of forest and typically you can do it with a, a predator proof fence, but that's a bit difficult for us here. So, so we go for intensive trapping using these good nature traps. And to date, uh, they're very effective. We've proven that they lower rat abundance in an area. And uh, what this will allow us to do is uh, do further releases into areas within their former range. Um, but now those areas will be protected from these key threats. 
and we'll be able to increase the numbers and then move towards creating as many viable and connected populations as, as possible. Thank you. Um, and as you work towards increasing the numbers and, you know, uh, ensuring that the birds are scattered uh, across, you know, the island, can you reach a point whereby you're saying uh, the carrying capacity is too much and this area cannot withhold and sustain these birds? Okay. Are, are you putting into consideration some of these things when, when, when you know, working towards, you know, increasing these bird numbers? Yeah, and it's a um, it's, it's difficult process because initially, like I said, the population is very small, the species is very rare, we have to act immediately. And, and so we were adaptive and we change in our approach. So we have a number, a number of subpopulations that uh, we could argue are carrying capacity. So you see this good increase in the numbers of your population, then you see it stabilizing maybe a few dips and jumps in your population over time as it stabilizes. And so there's a number of things we've learned through research that we need to, um, there's a different number of ways we approach it. For example, for the echo parakeet, when we released the species um, back when it was very rare and we were doing all we could to encourage breeding, we provided many nest boxes close together um, near the release site where we provide food. And that was beneficial initially because you increase breeding productivity and you likely increase the survival of released adults as well. But over time, as that population increases, uh, you've encouraged a higher density of parrots within an area than then that would occur naturally. And that causes issues. Um, and so what we've learned is moving forward with our release methodology is we want, we have a certain spacing for feeding stations um, from nesting sites and then between nesting sites. Uh, and this is linked to a number of different issues that come up over time. Uh, if birds are too densely packed, then we have issues with disease. We have issues with inbreeding. And so um, we now have a different approach to release than we previously did. And, uh, and we also are more uh, looking more closely at genomics and genetic management. And, and, and that technology is constantly evolving. So more and more is available in terms of the tools we can use to, 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 de to determine how best to genetically manage the population. So um, we were very keen on learning and, and um, evolving in our approach. Uh, but we also recognize that, um, you know, there's different, your population goes through different periods where if, if you have a population that is very rare and you're concerned about it, uh, the, the chance of extinction is very high. Um, you need to act as quickly as you can. And um, if, even if you do not have all the information, uh, sometimes you just have to go with what you have uh, and, and, and do what you can. And then as the population recovers, you have the opportunity to write some of the things that potentially you did initially. Um, but yeah, uh, it's something we're very, um, it's very important not to be too uh, hesitant before taking an approach if your population has become very rare. Thank you. Thank you, Sion. Um, Samson, I want to bring you in. Um, what, what sort of interventions have you put in place uh, in Ethiopia and how impactful have they been uh, to, to saving these endangered bird species? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to start uh, uh, to answer this by seconding uh, Hannah Mayen, uh, what she said, our uh, crucialities to the inclusion of um, uh, the yang into uh, this conservation activity. It is really, really critical uh, because I can give you one example. The white tail, flat tail uh, was uh, being protected by by uh, small children as eight and nine years old uh, um, from uh, cattle trampling and um, uh, being in the cheeks eaten by, uh, you know, predators by covering um, with dung and uh, uh, tying up uh, the grasses all together so that it won't be grazed. And uh, this has been done uh, because there was a very good uh, intervention at the state school and uh, telling them how important unique it is. So uh, the approach, including youngsters in, in this uh, conservation activity is, is uh, very, very crucial. It's really paramount. So um, what we have been uh, working was, you know, 
just doing a pure science, researching, doing transacts and getting the data and um, how critical the intervention has to be by itself won't solve the problem. That's what we learn and uh, we have to be a cross-sectoral in approaching this conservation problem uh, regarding the Liban arc and the Liban plains. So what we did was, you know, the, um, the grassland has to recover and the bush the bush thing, bush encroachment has to be stopped. And um, for that, uh, we, uh, we um, encourage the local stakeholders as well as uh, uh, the fence well, that we get from um, international uh, partners. We cleared 300 hectares uh, of, uh, um, um, you know, uh, sorry, we created a 300 hectare grassland in a community reserve of grassland uh, so that they can use it uh, during the drought time and also uh, you know uh, this this uh, this um, activity helps 1300 households by providing grass for their cattle they so it's a big deal and also we approached the yang uh, by by uh, you know uh, bringing them in community based organization under the saving uh, credit cooperative scheme where they set up, you know, and help them themselves uh, by owning a business, you know, for example, collecting tourists uh, visiting, um, correct, collecting some fees for tourists uh, visiting that area, which has a very huge potential of uh, uh, tourist activity as it is, uh, you know, one of the area, it is the Southern Indomix, you know, if, if you try to enlarge the area, uh, you will be able to see four um, indigenous birds in that area. So tourists will definitely go there uh, more frequently. So uh, the impact that will create to the local use um, on businesses is, is, is a big. So uh, uh, over the years, around 1,000 hectares of the plain has been cleared from encroaching acacia. And this has also really, really helped uh, uh, the local grassland uh, so that it can recover. But having said this, a lot has to be done in the future uh, to protect this critically endangered bird uh, because um, our data shows after doing all these things, uh, our data shows it's a, still a male skewed population and a very uh, low number of uh, birds as, as low as like 51 singing males in 2013. Imagine this is in 2013. Now we are in 2021. So a lot has to be done and the approach has to be a cross-sectoral. It has to be a holistic approach. We cannot only work on the bird or on the grass on the, or the local community, which are pastoralists, but uh, we have to get that balance so that um, the, the intervention can have its own pace and can continue after uh, you know, our intervention projects. Okay, Samson, and how has community buy-in uh, played a, a, a part in you know, uh, helping uh, your work and uh, you know, uh, to save these birds? How crucial is it uh, to include local communities in these uh, on the ground initiatives and programs? to ensure that they both benefit and the birds are also, you know, safe, to ensure mutually uh, a beneficial kind of coexistence between the two. Yeah. Yeah, uh, as you may expect, for example, if you go to a certain area and if you start to explaining about birds, which is, um, which could be a very unique and, and unpleasant idea because the farmers around there or the, the, the entire community has other pressing issues, it will not be interesting, you know, it will not be a good enough reason to act for the community. So we, we try to approach from two different parts. For example, for first, uh, we've been supporting the local high school and, you know, uh, uh, we're supporting them uh, to get more, more, uh, more knowledge about the birds and also helping them in kind so that they will show some kind of interest uh, for conservation. So we've been 
giving them uh, local guidebooks, binoculars, and then encourage the local environmental clubs to visit the site and you know uh, to show that kind of interest in birds and and uh, to to make them feel that uh, you know to say uh, that's mine i have to protect it probably in the future i'm the one who has to be guardian and in the future this can be you know uh, important ambassador for, for ethiopia and you know to represent the local uh, uh, community in the global scale and then when you go to the local community uh, the local community really really um, are interested in conserving the grassland they need the grass so so do we so what we were trying to do there was we were trying to engage with them uh, to help to eradicate or to, to dismantle this uh, encroaching bush. So we funded the activity and the local community participating in, 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 you know, in cutting and in, in uh, taking out uh, the, the uh, encroaching uh, acacia, acacia bushes. And also they were participating in giving their land uh, to for community grassland reserve so that the grass will not be cut or will not be touched for a certain period of time in that area and during the drought time people can use from that um, grass to 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 feed their cattle so it has got a, a national benefit so by participating by my by making them participate in these kind of activities uh, we were trying to engage the community uh, in a very uh, in a very good approach so that we can conserve also the bird's future because the bird needs a certain height of the grass to breed and protect itself from predators and uh, that will be achieved um, as the grass will not be cut for a certain period of time. So in the meantime, the cattle of that area uh, will will have ample ample grass to graze on. And then later on, when the drought comes, uh, they have this reserve to turn into. So uh, this is, uh, these are the, some of the approach we we're trying to, to engage the local uh, with, with, uh, with our project. We are also trying to teach them that how it is hard uh, to sustain agriculture in that area, because basically it is, it's a grassland, so the rainfall will only be enough for grass, not for crops. And maybe using using fertilizers and then additional some irrigation activities or getting some water from somewhere might help for one year or one season, but it will not be productive throughout the years. But what it does is that it will eradicate the grass type and you'll never get it back. So we are also trying to teach that into, then put that into our uh, uh, project activities and addressing this issue whenever we have got the chance uh, to, to engage with the community and local stakeholders. And uh, okay. this is how we've been, uh, we've been doing uh, for the last uh, uh, 10 years or so. Thank you, thank you, Samson. I want to bring in Salisha at this point. Um, Salisha, we, we all know partnerships and collaborations play a very, very important role in, you know, conservation, in the conservation world, and you cannot do this uh, work alone, uh, whether it's partnering with uh, law enforcement agencies, you know, uh, local communities, as Samson has just mentioned right now, you know, private sector, public sector, you know, the media. Uh, how, how has partnerships played a key role in taking your conservation work forward and ensuring that um, these birds are safe? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you said it, Deblex, we can't do this on our own, right? Each, uh, each sort of factor, each, each partner, each stakeholder brings something different to the table that's required to address the threat. So whether it's the community, you know, being present and being there and saying, yes, we recognize that these actions or this bird is super important, these actions that we're taking, we want to change, um, whether it's us coming in and saying, okay, you know, this is the reasons why 
this is uh, this is difficult. Let's work together. So it's and then whether it's the law enforcement then coming and then also saying, hey, this is wrong from the law side. So there's a there's a repercussion. So I think, you know, you can't, there is no conservation action, whether it's for vultures or fluff tails or lions or rhinos, there is no conservation action that one single entity can say, I have done, you know, I have saved this, this animal because it takes us all. It literally takes all of us. It's the community, it's the, you know, the wildlife authority, it's every stakeholder. You know, there's multiple people working in bird conservation. So it's not just bird life or bird life partners. It's every one of us that comes to the table. And I think without it, we wouldn't be anywhere, right? Because that's where you get into trouble is when you don't partner and you don't collaborate and you don't, you, you can't move forward because you're all then competing for the same resources and the same attention. Um, and then it becomes a vicious negative circle as opposed to a virtuous one where you're all sort of feeding off each other's skills and, and working together. Uh, for that bigger picture, which is, you know, we all we're all here for the same reason, at least, you know, nominally, right? We want to save save these creatures that we as humans have also caused uh, to become, you know, so close to the edge of extinction, you know, human actions. So I think when we when that is what's so beautiful beautiful about collaboration and so integral, it's that keeping us focused on that bigger picture and, and going away from I Celicia you know, want credit for this, or I, bird life want credit for this. It's it's about that bigger picture. Sure, it's about that bigger picture. I, I totally agree with you on that one. And I would like to bring Dr. Hanelin here, um, because when we talk about birds, they fly, they are migratory birds, and they can't stay in one area, you know, for a long time, they need to go and breed in other areas. Yeah, like the white-winged fluff tail, uh, you know, you've mentioned that uh, it, it comes to Ethiopia also uh, around some time there, you know, which is 4,000, around 4,000 kilometers from South Africa. How has interconnect and joint up conservation, you know, how is it important and why are partnerships uh, important? Thanks, and I can just agree with Salisha, collaboration is absolutely key. And just to illustrate that point, I'll just mention a, a few points around White Wing Fluffdale and, and the organizations that's been involved. So in, in 1992, the Middlepoint Wetland Trust was established. And it was just five very bird lovers, enthusiastic um, ornithologists that wanted to protect White Wing Fluffdale and conserve uh, the species not only in South Africa, but also in Ethiopia. So it was a strong connection with Middlepoint Wetland Trust and the bird life partner in Ethiopia, EWNHS, working with that community, establishing a site support group there that has literally excluded um, the cattle from grazing Burgo wetland during the breeding season. And I totally believe that that's had a large impact on the survival of the species at Burgo wetland. And that's why it's so important for us to continue this collaboration with the community there. Um, and then a few years ago, BirdLife South Africa got involved. We also got involved as the coordinator of the AWA International Species Working Group for the White Wing Fluffdale. And I'd like to highlight the importance that AWA has played, this intergovernmental treaty um, that's really brought governments together in um, conserving white wing fluffdale. So the governments of Ethiopia and South Africa. And we have an action plan and an implementation plan where we collaborate. And this has led our Department of Environment to establish a national task team, which involves a number of stakeholders in South Africa, including our provincial government to work together for the conservation of the species. Um, and I think it's also just important to mention the private landowners that so willingly um, working with us um, on the conservation of the species. And then also the donor support. We wouldn't be able to do it without partnerships for funding. So we've grown through years in terms of this project to have a species champion, Rock Jumper Birding Tour. So it's a bird life international species champion that's allowed us to have a full time position to conserve white wing fluffdale in South Africa. So, yeah, collaboration is, is really key. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for driving that point home. And I want to bring in Sion. Sion, what are some of the who are some of the partners that the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation works with and why why are, why are partnerships important? Yeah, thank you. So yeah, exactly as everyone else has mentioned so far, they're extremely important. So the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation, when it was founded, 
was founded with the help and in partnership with a number of groups. So the, it was supported by the governor, government of Mauritius and uh, later on with the creation of national parks. Uh, we now work closely with the National Parks and Conservation Service that uh, provides us support and um, resources. And then we also have a number of international organizations that we work with. Um, we work with um, zoos um, for their expertise, for their support. Um, Chester Zoo is a big supporter of our work. We work with the Zoological Society of London. We also work with um, other conservation organizations like uh, the Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust that has done a lot of work in Mauritius and obviously has very strong links to Mauritius. Um, we work with a number of universities uh, which really give us the support um, to the research work that we're doing and developing our research work, um, including the University of Kent, the University uh, of Nottingham. Uh, here in Mauritius, we work with the university. And, um, and as everyone else has mentioned, we're an NGO. So we rely on, pretty much completely rely on outside funding to be able to do our work. So um, if it wasn't for the people that fund us, the different organizations, different individuals, um, we wouldn't be able to exist. And it, 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 it determines the work that we can, that we can do. So we're extremely grateful to, to those uh, funders. And um, we also rely on in areas where our birds occur outside of protected areas. As mentioned, we, we need to work with landowners who um, uh, who give us the opportunity to come on their land and do surveys and work with the birds. And, um, and yeah, as, as we mentioned, this can, these things can't be done in isolation and um, we wouldn't have been able to achieve uh, the things we've achieved without it. And of course, uh, the teams we have here in the organization, um, a mixture of um, long-term hardworking staff, um, and also um, a group of volunteers that cycle through regularly. So those people obviously have also given their time and energy to the to the work and really brought in their ideas and their uh, their passion for for conserving these species. Thank you, thank you, Sion. Um, uh, we, let's move on to swiftly to part six of this discussion, and this is where we talk about you know the kind of support uh, this you, you, that you need from our listeners, and uh, this is a question that each of you will get a, a chance to answer. And how can our listeners support uh, your conservation efforts? And please let's begin with um, Samson Zelek. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know. Uh, our listeners can support us in basically in one thing uh, because uh, our listeners are all over the world. Increasing digital presence uh, could exponentially increase our support and timely location of resource. So, I say, let us post, retweet, or uh, and use main media, I mean, mainstream media. Uh, you know, to to speak about this podcast, to speak about. Libelark to speak about the conservation activities being done in Ethiopia. The more people uh, came to know about this project or related projects, the more they will be interested in to in get involved. And getting involved is, as you know, was just really, really um, easy these days. You know, starting by sending money, it could be by sending resources or, you know, uh, by volunteering to come and work and different things. So. Basically, increasing our digital presence it can help us. And then through the years, we've been working together with um, U.S. Fisheries and Wildlife Services, Bird, uh, Bird Fair, uh, supported at some point, and the Darwin Initiative, and then also Bird Life International. Many, many um, partners are helping us just because we are uh, working uh, on ground and we have a little a bit presence in the media. So uh, pushing this to the next level will definitely help us immensely. And I encourage everyone uh, to do so. Well, that is uh, increase our digital presence. Thank you. Dr. Hanelin, please. Thanks, Deblix. I would like to encourage people to really get involved with BirdLife South Africa and to know more about our organization and conservation efforts visit our website, www.birdlife.org.za 
and go to the button support us and and there's really two ways to get involved and it's not mutually exclusive one is to become a member and to really understand and follow and hear more about us and secondly to become a donor to help us to continue with this collaborative conservation efforts and and um yeah in advance thank you to everyone for their support thank you salisha uh, thanks, Diblix. Um, You know, Samson and Hanaline said pretty much everything I was going to say, but I would just, one message is that, uh, you know, we're all conservationists, all of us, each and every one of us. It's just the choices that we make. And so that's what I would encourage our listeners today is to, to sort of uh, nurture that conservationist within you and learn, you know, find that curiosity and hopefully that's what we spark with these converse conversations is that curiosity and to, to learn and to make a difference because each each person can make a difference it, 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 and that's what it takes you know going back to that collaboration thing that's what it will take each one of us making choices that are positive for birds um, and other wildlife. Thank you Salisha for that. Uh, Sion please. Yeah, so um, the same, you know, um, if pe people could learn more about the work we do here in Mauritius and uh, the species we have here in Mauritius, uh, they can visit our website, uh, Mauritian Wildlife, um, there's a hyphen between the two, .org. And to learn more about what we do, there's an, also an opportunity to support us if people are able to. Like I said, we, we rely on um, funders to be able to continue doing the work we do. and. Um, yeah, just in general, uh, encourage, as said, to encourage people to look into conservation, um, to value species, to really understand the, the importance of conserving these unique endemic species as well and, and the value that, that they hold. And, um, and that's it really, and then spreading um, a positive message around conservation. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much. As we look to mark uh, the World Endangered Species Day this Friday, what will be your parting shot really around, you know, in, summary, in, sum, in summarizing what we've just said, you know, uh, what will be the key message that you will want our listeners to remember? Uh, Dr. Hanelin, please. Yeah, I'd like to say um, birds are very visible in the environment and the important ecosystem indicators. So just imagine a world without birds or a world without a dawn chorus. And I'd really like to call on everyone to help us to protect um, our bird species for future generations and to enjoy and to celebrate even our common birds um, on World in Endangered Species Day. Thanks. Thank you, Salisha. Um, I'm going to be a bit cheeky, <laughs> but basically um, what I'd say is let's all band together so that we don't have to have World Endangered Species Day, that we just have World Celebration of Species Day. Um, yeah, that would be my message. Thank you. Uh, Samson? Please unmute yourself, please. Sorry. Having having birds in our surrounding is having everything. As, as birds have uh, different niches in different places, so we if we have uh, so many birds, the environment is clean and safe for everyone. So losing one species will have a definitely uh, cascading negative impacts on the parts of the ecosystem. The consequences may not be measured easily. Mind you, we did not finish studying their contribution to the ecosystem, let alone losing them. So, um, and also, uh, moreover, it has to be noted that these species also have the right to exist. So let us join ourselves in supporting these crucial, ac crucial conservation activities in different parts of the world with all our resources, especially uh, when it comes to our country, we cannot spend great amount of resources toward conservation efforts. We need all the supports that we can get to sustain uh, the continued efforts of conserving our endangered uh, species. So let us be heard and uh, 
let's get this support uh, from everywhere. Let's join our forces and let us not say nothing. Let our voice be heard all over the world. Let's join together and support these conservation activities. Thank you. Thank you, Samson. Sion, please. Yeah, thank you. So um, I would like to say just um, to, to try and send a positive message that there's a lot of, obviously there's a lot of species and a lot of habitats that are in a, in a declining state or gain um, increasingly poorer state. And there's a lot of concern around habitat loss, habitat destruction, all the pressures that we talked about today. But regardless, there's been a number of successes as well over the last few years. And um, we've learned a lot in the last few decades and um, we've achieved a lot of good work. So essentially my message is um, looking at Mauritius and looking at the numbers we got to uh, and where we're at today, um, if these can be achieved, but uh, populations can be restored. Um, we can restore ecosystems. It, most of what's required is just hard work. You just need to put a lot of energy, a lot of time um, not give up when when things go wrong because they will constantly go wrong, and um, and just and just go for it. And if uh, like I said before, uh, if if there's something that we think could work, if you need to try it, try it and um, work your hardest to to save those species. Thank you so much, Sion, for that. Uh, what a brilliant, brilliant conversation we've had. Um, what a session. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for gracing this session and for the great efforts that you put really on the ground with the partners, with everyone that you work with uh, to, to saving these birds from extinction. And as Salisha, as Salisha has said, we, we will look forward to that day where we'll be celebrating, you know, we will have a celebration of world celebrations, uh, a bird's day or something like that, you know, because every species or biodiversity in this world is, is key and uh, we are all interconnected. And when you remove the white winged fluff tail from the ecosystem, when you remove the, the rhino from the ecosystem, then you alter the whole thing. And uh, my hope is as uh, travel reopens, you know, tourists will, will travel slowly and take a keen interest in birds, really. So thank you so much uh, for, for this session. Thank you for your nuggets of wisdom. I appreciate it so much. Over to you, um, um, Lewis. Thank you.